Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Mega Projects. This is sort of a two-parter thing that we've got going on. This one is planned to be the first video this week. Later in this week we'll be doing something else. So this one is about Concord and then later in the week we have sort of the Russian Soviet version of Concord which is called the Tupolev something or other, the TU something, which I don't remember right now. I should probably have in my notes, but basically the Russian version of Concord which was in many ways even more intense. But for now, let's jump into Concord, but do subscribe so that later in the week you will get a little notification all about that video. So let's get into it. Fast, loud, and sexy. Just a few of the many words that have been used to describe this visionary aircraft that was first unveiled to the general public at the Paris Air Show in 1969. Quite simply, unlike anything we'd ever seen before, it was a beacon of engineering ingenuity that shone brightly for only 30 years. An aircraft so ahead of its time, it was retired without a successor, because frankly, we're not even sure what comes next. And of course, we're talking about Concord. Every now and again, humanity leaps forward. We've come to assume that technology progresses in this sort of linear fashion. We create something and then it's improved upon just a little bit over time. It's just all of these little incremental steps. But occasionally, we launch forward to such a point that it makes further progress difficult or even impossible. These projects are the outliers, the futuristic visions that are so far ahead that they sometimes struggle to find their place in our time. Certainly true for Concorde, like supersonic flight, not a thing today. And just as a personal note, as expensive as it is, I would love to travel on Concorde. I'd love to travel faster than the speed of sound. Tearing through the skies at a maximum speed of 1,352 miles per hour, that's 2,180 kilometers per hour, and shattering the sound barrier, Concorde was one such engineering feat. We're now approaching 20 years since Concorde took its last flight, but in that time, no commercial passenger airliner has come anywhere near what Concorde was capable of. In terms of size and passenger capacity, airliners today have never been bigger, but when it comes to speed, altitude, and indeed just aura, Concorde remains unmatched. And in terms of like what airplane looks the coolest, Concorde. <laughs> But this was also a project that raised serious questions about environmental issues, affordability, and noise pollution. This was an extraordinary airplane that eventually, because of a combination of political and social situations, became a victim of its own pioneering vision. The US Bell X-1 fighter jet became the first aircraft to fly supersonic in 1945, meaning it broke the sound barrier and was capable of flying at speeds in excess of 767 miles per hour, that's 1,234 kilometers per hour, or above Mach 1. Fun note here, and I haven't checked recently, but I'm relatively sure, uh, Chuck Yeager was the chap who first broke, broke the sound barrier. He is one of those people who is, you know, surprised they are still alive. Chuck Yeager, still with us so far. Over the next two decades, many military aircrafts flew above this speed, but most questioned whether larger passenger aircrafts would ever be able to match it. In 1955, the Royal Aircraft Establishment, RAE, a British aviation research group, released a report in which the concept was explored for the first time in Britain. While the technology and indeed knowledge around supersonic air travel was still in its infancy, most agreed that the drag at supersonic speed was directly correlated with the wingspan. In layman's terms, the plane's wingspan had to be very narrow to be aerodynamic enough to reach such speeds and remain stable. The Boeing 707, released in 1959, had a wingspan of 42.6 meters, that's 130 feet, which would be virtually impossible for supersonic travel, so the RAE suggested something closer to the planned Avro 730. This was a planned British reconnaissance aircraft with a wingspan of just under 18.2 meters or 60 feet. But such a narrow wingspan would result in very little lift at low speed, meaning it would need a huge runway for takeoff 
and landing would be at incredibly high speeds. And I've actually already read the uh, the script for the Russian Concorde video coming later this week, and definitely subscribe because there's interesting stuff about how fast that plane had to land and take off. Anyway, back to the video. Initial studies found the concept to be unfeasible, but shortly after this, the delta wing design appeared. These triangular-shaped wings that we would eventually see on Concorde led to a breakthrough and paved the way towards supersonic commercial flights. In 1956, a new research group, Supersonic Transport Aircraft Committee (STAC), was formed in Britain, and by the end of the decade, it was clear that something important was emerging. Contact was made with both the American and French governments over a possible collaboration, but by the start of the 1960s, it was still anybody's guess where the first supersonic airliner would appear. Now, if you watched our video about the Channel Tunnel, which, while was planned to go before this one, is actually going to come after, so subscribe to get that. You'll know that when these old warring neighbors really want to, Britain and France, they can collaborate with astonishing success. To the surprise of many, in 1960, a partnership emerged between British Aircraft Corporation and Sud Aviation in France. Though they didn't agree on everything, it was the British and the French after all, there was certainly enough to move forward. On November 29, 1962, the British and French government signed an international treaty that effectively greenlit the project and included several penalties for cancellations. This set off some alarm bells in Washington. Not only did it appear that the British and French would lead the way in supersonic travel, but the Soviets, of all people, were also developing their own supersonic passenger airline, the Tupolev Tu-144. Thank you, there it is, coming later this week, subscribe, said it again. <laughs> now we're not going to go to that aircraft now because it has its own video which we're going to do later, but the Americans were worried and they pushed forward with their own design, the Boeing 2707, which was eventually cancelled in 1971. Anyway, back to the Europeans. They really needed a name that exemplified the entire project, and one that reflected the Anglo-French partnership. The word chosen means agreement, harmony, and union in both French and English, but of course carries an extra E at the end in the French version. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan controversially dropped the final E, some say because of a perceived slide from Charles de Gaulle. However, at the press unveiling in 1967, Tony Benn, the Minister of Technology, announced that the government was restoring the E to much nationalistic outrage fueled by the British press. <laughs> wow, who really cares? His eventual explanation was that the E stood for Excellence, England, Europe, and Entente Cordiale, which were a series of agreements reached in the 19th century between Britain and France. This all seemed to calm the rabble, and the E stood. Sounds a bit like an excuse though, doesn't it? And that he uh, just ended up having it the French way. Which is fine. Who cares? In 1965, construction began on the first two prototypes. Concorde 001 was constructed by Aerospatiale in Toulouse, with Concorde 002 being built by BAC in Bristol. But with the engineers working feverishly behind the scenes, the most pressing matter for the project was future sales. The vast amounts of money needed for the project meant that in order to be profitable, there would need to be plenty of buyers. In 1967, a marketing campaign began aimed at attracting airlines companies from all over the world. Concorde bosses had made the bold prediction of 350 aircrafts worldwide by 1980, yet while it certainly garnered interest and a non-binding order of 62 planes from 16 companies, it remained well below what had been anticipated. More on that shortly, and of course this is Concorde. The whole story is very commercial and we'll be getting into all of that as well. Lastly, as most of these kinds of projects tend to do, the cost spiraled well beyond what was originally calculated. This is a mega projects video. That does tend to happen. Original estimates place the production costs at £70 million in total, but eventually it cost an eye-watering £1.3 billion. That's more than £8 billion today. The final unit cost of a plane in 1977 was £23 million, which is £120 million in today's money. On the 2nd of March 1969, Concorde 001 took to the skies above Toulouse, piloted by André Ducard, and seven months later, on October the 1st, it went supersonic for the first time. Concorde 002 later became airborne for the first time on the 9th of April 1969, piloted by Brian Trubshaw. The early 1970s saw the advertising campaign expand even further, with Concorde 001 visiting numerous countries around the world to help drum up business. But it didn't work. Despite a public interest, a perfect storm was brewing that would set Concorde 
sales back from the very start. A stock market crash and an oil crisis in 1973, along with the crash of the Soviet Tubalov at the Paris Air Show, proved disastrous for Concorde sales. The vast financial implications of Concorde were becoming clear, and it began to hemorrhage orders, eventually only leaving British Airways and Air France, both of whom were able to rely on their governments for support. But despite all of the problems with sales, the world still watched in awe on the 21st of January 1976 as two full Concorde flights departed simultaneously on their maiden voyages. One from London Heathrow to Bahrain, and the other from Paris to Rio de Janeiro, with a stop in Senegal along the way. This was an aircraft that quickly became iconic, not simply because of its speed, but also because of its sleek exterior design. But you might be surprised to hear that when the plane first launched, the design inside looked a bit more Ryanair than British Airways business class. It was decidedly unluxurious. Things did eventually change, with much larger leather seating eventually being added, but this was always an airplane that placed speed above comfort. The windows were tiny, designed to maximize the strength of the airframe rather than supply much of a view to those who had paid a small fortune to be on board. At 61.66 meters, that's 202 feet 4 inches in length, Concorde was roughly 10 meters shorter than a modern Boeing 747 with a wingspan of just 25.6 meters, that's 84 feet. All in all, this plane was really a lot smaller than a 747. Concorde's maximum takeoff weight of 408,000 pounds, that's 185,070 kilograms, about 15 double decker buses, was just half of that of the 707s, that's 735,000 pounds or 333. 1,400 kilograms. When it was airborne, Concorde had a maximum altitude of 60,000 feet, an astonishing 15,000 feet higher than that of a 747. This is so high that you can actually see the curvature of the Earth probably through those tiny windows. Apart from their delta wings, perhaps the most iconic aspect of the plane was its droop nose. If you've ever seen two pictures of a Concorde and thought to yourself, well, why do the noses look so different? Well, it was because the nose could be set in two positions. The best aerodynamic position is straight ahead, and this was used when airborne. However, it does obscure the pilot's view, definitely not something you want when the plane is coming in to land at 187 miles per hour. To solve this problem, the nose can be lowered by 12.5 degrees, giving a lovely, clear view of the quickly approaching land beneath you. Another area that needed to be different was its brakes. A typical Concorde landing at Heathrow meant that the temperatures of the brakes could reach between 300 and 400 degrees Celsius, or 573 to 752 Fahrenheit. To handle this sort of heat, each wheel had multiple discs, which were cooled by electric fans, while the brakes themselves were made from carbon rather than steel, significantly reducing their weight. Concorde was powered by four Olympus 593 turbojets built by Rolls-Royce Bristol Sidley, and Snekma. Each one of these beasts produced 38,000 pounds of thrust. On board, Concorde had a crew of three, two pilots, and a flight engineer. This was complemented with nine flight attendants, always on hand with the champagne and beluga caviar. That's not a joke, by the way. If you're paying that much, you expect a little more than a bag of peanuts and a cold pasta dish. So I guess it's not entirely like Ryanair, although on Ryanair they they just give you nothing. But let's be honest, you can get champagne anywhere, and what you can't do anywhere is break the sound barrier, and most passengers waited in anticipation for the captain to announce that they had gone supersonic, which was virtually impossible to tell by simply looking out of the window. There was one common, very cool phrase often heard over the intercom on Concorde. I just wanted to let you know how the flight is progressing. The answer is quickly. Almost from its inception, Concorde faced opposition, while many of the early objections related to safety, by the 1970s, most focused on noise and environmental problems. By far the biggest issue was the sonic boom created by Concorde. This is the noise generated by shockwaves when an object travels faster than the speed of sound. Extra little tidbit of information for you here. The cracking sound of a bullwhip, it's a mini little sonic boom. The volume of a sonic boom can seem to fluctuate quite a bit and sometimes cannot even be heard on the ground, but often it absolutely could. 
Concorde's 100 to 110 decibel sonic boom was said to mimic a small explosion. Now, that sounds hellish enough, especially when it's above your home, but that's actually only about the same number of decibels as a car horn, so it's not that bad. The US Congress banned Concorde from US airspace, preventing the lucrative transatlantic routes that had always been planned. Eventually, this was lifted, but individual cities still prohibited them, most notably New York City. This was despite a report showing that Air Force One, the US presidential plane, was actually louder than the Concorde. In fact, the plane was much quieter than was generally perceived, especially with pilots throttling back their engines while flying over urban areas. It was as if people had built up the sound of the plane in their mind rather than being realistic about its actual noise. At the time of the US ban, it led some to question the US government's motives and whether it had more to do with protecting US prestige and aviation manufacturing rather than noise pollution just speculation. However, it wasn't just the US. Many countries around the world rejected the chance to be on Concorde routes or to allow it to fly through their airspace. The environmental impact that Concorde left was also keenly addressed by activists. With a full load, Concorde had a 15.8 passenger miles per gallon ratio, while the large Boeing 707 had a 33.3 PMG. It's a bit like looking at a Hummer today. It's definitely not the most environmentally friendly way to travel. In fact, Concorde could burn two tons of fuel by just taxiing along the runway. As our awareness of climate change grew, it just became harder to justify these fuel-guzzling speed demons. But perhaps the most glaring issue was its tagline as an elitist form of transportation. In 1997, a return flight from London to New York would set you back around $7,995, which is $12,700 in 2019, roughly 30 times more expensive than the cheapest available airfare. This is simply not a service that every man and woman could afford. Many airlines themselves were now focusing on affordability rather than style and speed. It was all beginning to look like Concorde's day were numbered. In its time, Concorde completed roughly 50,000 flights and shuttled 2.5 million passengers around the world. But perhaps with the exception of its inaugural takeoff, the flight many remember most vividly occurred on the 25th of July. 2000. Watching a Concorde in action, it was a sight to behold, with its 250 mph, 402 km/h takeoff speed and 187 mph, 300 km/h landing speed, it was significantly faster than most airliners we have today. But as this Concorde roared along the runway on its departure from Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport, it was immediately clear that disaster was looming. As flight 4590 lifted into the sky, a torrent of flames erupted from engine number 2. The pilots on board shut down the stricken engine but with engine number one surging as a result, the aircraft failed to gain altitude and plummeted back to Earth, killing all 100 passengers and nine crew. An investigation into the crash revealed that an aircraft had taken off moments earlier and shed a metallic strip. When Flight 4590 surged along the runway, it ran over the strip, piercing a tire, which exploded. A fragment of the tire then hit the fuel tank, causing the fuel leak and leading to the fire. However, further investigation raised questions about the official narrative of the story. Eyewitnesses claimed that the metallic strip was in fact a thousand feet from the path of the aircraft, and perhaps it had more to do with an unbalanced weight distribution in the fuel tanks and loose landing gear that caused the aircraft to veer off course. To this day, doubts remain about what really happened to Concorde on its darkest day. All Concords were grounded for almost a year, but returned to testing in July 2001. Then, one morning in September, the first flight with passengers since the crash in Paris landed safely in New York, carrying British Airways crew. Hours later, the world changed, and it proved to be one of the final nails in Concorde's coffin. On September the 11th, 2001, four American airline flights were hijacked in the skies above the United States. The resulting terrorist attacks sent shockwaves around the world, with the airline industry suffering catastrophic losses. Numerous carriers went out of business, and the industry as a whole lost around $11 billion in revenue. For a service that had become an expensive extravagance, the more austere method of air travel after 9-11 spelt the end for Concorde. Air France operated its final commercial flight on the 3rd of May 2003, while in Britain, October saw a grand farewell tour in which a Concorde travelled back and forth from London to cities around the country, often flying low and slowly above urban areas to give the public an opportunity to glimpse these wizards of the skies for the last time. 
On the 23rd of October 2003, the last Concorde to leave London flew west to New York, with Windsor Castle, the official residence of the royal family, illuminated to mark the historic moment. The following day, three Concords converged over London, circling the city ceremoniously before landing one after the other. The age of Concords was over, and we had only ever seen 20 of them. In 2015, Club Concord, essentially a Concord fan club, announced that it had secured £160 million to bring one Concord back into service. Though the initial date for this, 2019, has come and gone with very little recent information about the venture. Many doubt the feasibility of refitting one of these planes and putting them in the sky once again. It may be a nice idea, but the practicalities do look pretty remote. While we may never see a Concorde in the skies again, there are small passenger planes on the horizon that will be able to break the speed of sound once again, some of which may be operational by 2023. However, it's likely even the biggest of these will only be about half the size of Concorde. If we want to really look to the future, then we need to talk about hypersonic flight. NASA is already trialing planes that can far exceed Concorde's Mach 2, with hopes that eventually we will have airplanes capable of traveling above Mach 5 or 3,000 miles per hour, 6,174 kilometers per hour, meaning a flight from San Francisco to Sydney could be completed in two hours rather than the 15 hours today. And if you'd like a video about hypersonic aircrafts, could probably do something on that. I'm not sure if there's enough information to do one on a specific hypersonic aircraft, but if you have suggestions and ideas, let me know in the comments below. While hypersonic flight might seem like a distant dream today, I remember that what was first conceived in the 1950s was also considered a futuristic absurdity by some. Concorde was an extraordinary achievement for many reasons, but if nothing else, gave us a fleeting glimpse of the future, a dream that came and went, unable to find its place in the present. We've already seen the future, and it happened 50 years ago. So with that, I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, smash the like button. Do not forget to subscribe, because later this week, we have the Russian version of Concord, which is a little bit different. So please do subscribe for that, turn on the notification bell so you find out about it. And as always, I'll see you then.